So, yes, welcome from my side. And Nicola, I hand over to you directly. Hello, good morning, everyone. Warm welcome to uh, the Vega breakfast. Let me share my screen. Can you confirm you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. So warm welcome and uh, happy breakfast to all of you. Virtual breakfast today with uh, with Vega. Uh, the topic for this uh, this breakfast will be streaming and using uh, clinical trial data for drug safety uh, review. And uh, I've got the pleasure to to have uh, Philip Mark uh, from Novartis uh, joining us today. And um, as you know, the principle of this uh, of this uh, breakfast, uh, I will manage a short introduction of Vega for the people who, who are joining us for the first time to have uh, an overview of uh, what we are doing and to give you an overview of uh, the activities we are performing at Vega. It will take a 10 minutes and then I will hand over to, to Philippe for his presentation. Um, so we've got, we plan to have roughly one hour sessions. Uh, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so what we propose is to use the chat and to, if you can, during the presentation of Philip, put your question in the chat box. We can just uh, mention and try to summarize everything at the end of the presentation. Uh, so we plan to give uh, plenty of time for questions. So be uh, be active today at this uh, breakfast to, to ask a lot of questions regarding the presentation. And, um, being said, so I will uh, I will move on to the Vega introduction. So warm welcome to the networking breakfast, the March breakfast for for Vega. Um, just want to let you know a little bit uh, some uh, information about Vega. So it's uh, Vega. We are a well-established uh, company. We are based in Basel. We are celebrating our 30 years uh, this year, so it's a huge accomplishment. It's a well-established uh, service company. We are offering uh, informatic services in the life science and the pharmaceutical sector for 30 years. And our key mission is uh, to build a bridge uh, between business and IT. And that's a really uh, the key message we've got uh, at Vega. Uh, we have uh, our strengths, our people, our employee. We've got uh, people with dual qualification in the science and IT. And that's the reason we, we can deliver uh, a lot of uh, good services uh, and efficient solution to our customers because we understand very well the, the requirements and the, and the customer needs, and uh, we can propose and uh, implement new solutions. And we are very uh, on zone and making a lot of uh, projects uh, with the pharma and healthcare industry. Just to give you an idea of uh, what we are offering and uh, the types of domain where we are doing uh, our activities, so we offer 360 degrees informatic services in the life science. We are exclusively dedicated for life science and pharmaceutical uh, sector. And we've got four pillars of uh, competencies and uh, we are building, implementing and uh, supporting, uh, I would say IT business solutions in the following domain. So on the top uh, left, you see laboratory and research informatics. Uh, this domain includes all everything regarding uh, lab digitalization. So it's starting from a smart lab concept. We can have a strategic consulting regarding a digital automation of labs. We've got a chromatography data systems uh, implementation, uh, lean systems implementation, electronic lab notebook. We've got also a group dedicated for sample logistic, and we are making biobanking just to give you an example of uh, the types of services we are doing in the lab and uh, research informatic group. The second group on the top right is a clinical development informatic and uh, data science we are doing also in this, uh, in this domain. So in the clinical space, we are helping our uh, pharma companies to select tools, to implement tools, to make uh, clinical process optimizations, to help them to manage data ingestion, data integration, any types of data from R&D to, to clinical uh, into the cloud environment. We are making a lot of data standardization regarding the, what we call the FAIR principle, uh, the CDIS compliant transformation. We are also doing a lot of data analytics and uh, in this uh, domain for clinical, we are doing also data science. So using the new technology, AI, ML and NLP uh, technology for research and for clinical data. So how we can extract the best of, uh, of our data. 
And also we are using a lot of data visualization tools and, uh, and systems to transform this data into something which is uh, meaningful for our customers. And uh, so that's the topics we are we are covering in this, uh, in this domain. As a third pillar, it's a uh, bottom right, uh, computer system validation and quality assurance. Then we develop specific uh, CSV strategy. We train our customers and we make our customer ready for any types of uh, regulatory requirements and also inspections and uh, so we are covering from GXP data governance we are covering uh, 21 CFR part 11 compliance GAM 5 so this type of topics in the CSV groups it is a very growing uh, topic at the moment and we are also exploring uh, initiative and uh, on medical devices we are developing and helping our customer for the software as a medical device uh, strategies which is quite important at the moment also and the last uh, domain, which is a original domain of for Vega, was informatic solution, and it is still there. We are helping our customers to select and to implement uh, and maintain their IT solution for for their business. So you see, in a nutshell, in a, in a few minutes, the four uh, the four topics, and um, we are very very, I would say, in terms of differentiation, we are very well known to know very well the business and to have both this business and informatic expertise together. And that's very what we make our uh, very different from uh, from our competition and what, what is making us also successful for the last 30 years. So uh, we are uh, headquartered in Basel, but we are developing a lot in, uh, in Germany, in uh, Benelux, in France. We've got also customers in the, in the DAR regions. And uh, so we doubled the size of the company the last three years. We are more than roughly 100 permanent people, but uh, 130 people all together working for Vega at the moment. So a very successful uh, story, uh, the Vega uh, journey at the moment. Maybe uh, just the next slide to give you some uh, quick uh, information what's going on in the upcoming events uh, at Vega. So if you want to see us and to meet us, we will be visible and we will present uh, at the Paper Lab Academy uh, in April in Italy, in uh, Lag Lago Maggiore, a nice place for the for an event. Uh, the next event in um, in May is also the Future Lab, uh, the Lab Volition in uh, Hanover in Germany in May. And uh, we've got also, we are ready for the Future Labs in June. Um, so end of May, beginning of June, the Future Labs uh, event uh, in Basel. So that's the three events uh, we are covering for the next quarter. But we still have also a lot of other events coming uh, until all the year. So you can go to our website if you want to, to know more and to want to, to meet all of us uh, in the future. Now moving to the what you are coming from. So, uh, so the breakfast, uh, we just want to apologize because it's still a virtual breakfast for this time. Uh, so we we may have to go finally to a very physical uh, breakfast. Originally before the COVID, it was a, a physical breakfast uh, in the Basel area. Um, so I just want to hope that uh, you will have some uh, good uh, brain food from, from Philip today. And uh, that we can uh, we can move on for for the presentation. So I uh, just uh, warm welcome to to Philip Mark. Uh, we will talk about the streaming and using uh, clinical trials data for uh, drug safety review. And uh, just as an introduction, uh, so first of all, thanks Philip for for joining and to be part of this meeting. Uh, Philip is a global head for uh, integrated data science uh, services. is uh, at NIBR, so Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. Uh, he holds a PhD in computational science from Paris University and he's done also a biology oriented postdoc uh, fellow in the lab of uh, George Church at the Howard Medical uh, School. Um, so, Philip has a long experience. He started with uh, Haventis, uh, worked with Sanofi, and he joined uh, 10 years ago Novartis uh, to take over uh, a lot of interesting projects. Uh, his teams uh, develop a lot of tools to improve and to uh, expedite the transnational medicine data analysis and decision making. And uh, more recently, uh, Philippe has been also involved in shaping uh, global projects uh, like the Novartis Data 42 at the NIBR and uh, the data strategy. So his main driver is to use data to accelerate drug discovery and to bring new drugs to uh, patients faster. And uh, so warm welcome again to all of you and uh, hope you, you will have a wonderful breakfast this morning. On over to you, Philip.
Thanks, Nicola. Nice introduction. So thanks for, for getting me at that uh, Vega breakfast. Thanks for everyone coming to share the breakfast this morning. Um, as just said by Nicola, it's still virtual, but well, it's uh, it's nice to see many people from all the place. So it's also the, the beauty of that virtualization we have now. Um, I will still the, the focus on the uh, share the slides from, uh, from my side now. On uh, what I would like to to show today to give you is um, well an example of course of something real that we created, but I would like also to give you a little bit of context on uh, well tell you about where we go now with all this clinical data that we are able to get in a better shape than it was uh, even five years ago actually. So where to start? So first thing, uh, well just to say that being at Novartis is uh, a blessing. Uh, well, of course, because well, we are reaching out to uh, nearly 800 million patients. So that's just in terms of sense of purpose is great. But also because well, it's just a fantastic place to work. So you see uh, 9 billion on R&D budget. So we can really do things. And we have more than 500 uh, ongoing clinical trials right now. So that's for the company as a whole. And if, if I focus on NIBA, which is the research part of Novartis, uh, well, we have a Fantastic pipeline, a lot of things ongoing. Too many things ongoing. <laughs> many are, are thinking it's too much and we should focus. But still, at the end, again, 2.6 billion US dollars to work on to create data. At the end, a pharma company is going to create one thing it's intellectual property on compounds, which is a, a data actually, a data set. Uh, all the things to prove that the compound is useful, all the things explaining how to create that small molecule, that biologics, that uh, gene therapy. And that's for me really all that money is going into the production of data. At the end, if one day we are hacked, uh, I expect uh, most of the people to be able to produce the same compounds. But we have the exclusivity, we have the IP, and we have a know-how which is generations of researchers on uh, drug developers who have been building all that. So, Great place to work. On uh, on top of that, we have a CEO with, which is really smart. So here yeah, I like that quote. So what uh, Vas is saying here is that uh, basically we don't know much about biology. We have to be very humble. But with computers now, we can certainly do things. There are things where we are going to win. But again, you see how it's phrased. It's not like AI is going to save the world. Well, maybe it will, you never know. But for research, clearly, it's going to help, but it's not like we are going to crack everything. And I think that's really smart. So that's a quote which is uh, three or four years old already, so it's not naive at all since a long time. And we can really see uh, Novartis over time experimenting into AI with specialists, with collaborations, with uh, um, big, big, big uh, projects. And then also focusing on putting the money on people who are really doing the real things uh, in the weeds and who are benefiting from the acceleration of these new things. So that's really where we are now. And if I look at uh, the pipeline of Novartis, so just a uh, well, high level view, but from the target to the clinical part, you will find everywhere some machine learning, deep learning, whatever is the AI keyword, keyword today. So it's clear for target identification, it's historically what we call the bioinformatics. It's very clear for it on lead finding on the lead optimization. So for small molecule, that was the chemoinformatics. Now we have a whole branch of biologics, of course, and then we have genome cell therapy, which are very close to the bio bioinformatics again. So all these parts have tons of new technologies coming, large data sets, tons of things to model. It's really exciting. And of course, there was a lot of progress in the recent years on uh, many things. Um, AlphaFold is usually the one which is mentioned, which is a way to predict the structure of proteins, something that during my PhD, I was trying to, <laughs> to crack actually uh, for, for some time. And uh, it's really, well, it took 20 years, but we are there. So really great expectations there. But for me, to be honest, I'm more working on the, the other part of the picture here, meaning the integrated pharmacology, which means understanding how the compound works, what it's going to do, and also the trial uh, efficacy. So basically, you want to understand if the compound is going to, to have efficacy. Uh, 
but of course it needs to work <laughs> otherwise it's not great and then you want to check if it's safe if it's not going to have problems and the difference between the two is the theoretical index which needs to be large if you want to be able to use your compound on the general population uh, except if you are really on the disease like oncology where well, adverse events can be tolerated so on the extreme right there, uh, well, most of these things are things we have been working on uh, in the in the team. Well, all of them actually. And uh, well, there are really a lot of things happening in the, the clinical trials. But before we extending later on uh, all these new things, I just want to give you uh, uh, an, uh, a quick view on something very punctual but very important actually, which is how we how we got the data from clinical trials to flow at Niebuhr into one place that is usable by uh, many and uh, that's a key enabler and it's because of that that we can do the other things so you will see i'm going to tell you a little bit more about that so first thing so who is looking at the the clinical trial data um quite a few people but well just here i would just say clinical medical people and they will have a few ways to do it the first thing are all the listings that's the historical way uh, you give people tons of paper well, that can be virtualized, but to be honest, long, long list of things. Uh, list for the studies on them, patient profiles, uh, one per patient in the, uh, well, to get the subject level view. Uh, when you think about uh, things where we have 10 or 20,000 patients, so it can happen in uh, cardiovascular, in CNS also, we have very large uh, cohorts, uh, well, it's nightmarish. Then you can also go directly into the, the system collecting the data, which is in the middle here. Uh, so it's really reserved to people who are on site because, well, as sponsors, Novartis as a sponsor can't see the details of who are in the clinical trials. That needs to be uh, anonymized or at least coded, which means that uh, someone can find out who, uh, who these people are, but not a Novartis. And very often we'll have to anonymize uh, just to comply with different regulations on the informed consent. But well, so that's really the traditional ways that all the companies are doing. And now on the right part, you have uh, something that emerged uh, maybe a decade ago in, uh, in many companies now. It's the idea that uh, we need um, for these people who are MD, PhDs or MDs, well, people who are basically medics, we need to give them some interfaces to pull the data. Otherwise, there is no way. The listings are going to kill them and uh, there is no way we'll be efficient. So. Two levels there. So the first level is, well, can we create a report or a dashboard that would be generic for everyone? And then, well, sometimes you will have specific things. So can you use other systems uh, like, well, here we mentioned Spotfire. There are other things actually that you that you can use. And uh, most of the clinical stats now are, are more into uh, uh, R, R shiny, migrating from SAS to R on Python. So probably not Spotfire, but well, at Niebuhr, we like Spotfire for some reason, historical reasons. Okay, so just I'm going to speak about the, the right part a little bit here, the visualization, starting simply with the fact that we develop things here. Uh, so I'm going to show you what uh, what we did on that part. So first thing, what kind of data? What are we discussing? So clinical trials, fine, what's that? And uh, on here, we think about clinical trials that are coming live. I'm coming back in uh, two slides to that, but uh, what what can I get? On the, on the left side here, you see what I need for the safety. So deciding, well, deciding, checking if I have issues with the safety of the compound. Um, so of course, well, there are things that are obvious, like uh, well, if you go to the top demographics and want to know who is in, it's not the same if it's a, a child or an elderly uh, person. I want to see the adverse events, of course. The, Co-medication, the other things that were taken, like well, if you have a I don't know liver failure, for example, you will probably well often find acetam acetaminophen, COX-2 inhibitors. So we know that it's, there are some combinations that are problematic. And then there is a long list. So exposure is the dose, disposition is how you exit the study, the medical history is all the things you had in the past. Of course, well, if you join the study being in a, well not really in shape, that can explain the problems you have later on. And then lab data, like all the things you can measure out of fluids, uh, vital signs, ECG, a lot of things. On pharmacology, there will be a, a whole set of things that are special. So just to tell you that's where we start. So you already need all that at minima 
to get a view on what's going on. But then on the right side, there are more there. And you can see that, uh, for example, well, if I'm in REST respiratory, I will have specific endpoints that I need to follow. That's, uh, so that's going to be another data domain. Uh, we are going to have biomarkers. Uh, we are going to need to probably replug the samples to be able to check a little bit what's going on on many things like that. So it's a, it's a complex picture on uh, while well, we are helped by, uh, by the standardization. Uh, so here it's a CDISC, which is behind. So that's uh, it's becoming easier to, to get the raw data. It's still not totally easy, but at least, uh, well, again, over the last decade, well, let's say 15 years, we went from CDs being um, really hard to now CDs being everywhere. Well understood by CROs, uh, we have agreement about how to store things. It's becoming a lot better. It's not a done deal, and we can we discuss that uh, in the questions. There are many limitations, but at least the data are more or less under control. That's the the main uh, the main idea here. On that's complex. It's not like I just collect adverse events. No, no, no. It's uh, more complex than that. I'm going to collect many data. Okay. The next question is well. Okay, I have the data. Who needs what? On there, that's a little bit complex also. So the some people like the study monitors. Some people who are in charge of the studies, checking that things are ongoing are happening. We need data very fast. We we'll need to see the things that are happening to be able to check basically every day uh, uh, what's going on. Then if I go to the bottom, the FDA, that's late. They will get the things very late. And what they need is really the final data corrected, clean to the last digit. And uh, by the way, under the whole GSP uh, setting, so GCP uh, and GLP and uh, the whole uh, GSP setting. So there is really uh, different people having different needs. Um, the safety review uh, is going to go with the study monitor up there. And the, we can have things that are not complete. For example, typically, the adverse events are mapped to a, a, a code list that is called the Medra. And if it's not fully mapped, well, we can still work on that. And people well, will be able to, the, the human being will be able to correct the few problems we have if we have some. Um, when we have data explorers, so that we define as people who are going to use UIs to explore the data, or them on the right, the data scientists, which are people who are going to code to explore data. Uh, well, they can accommodate a certain level of uh, problems in the data, but while well, it needs to be uh, quite clean, and here again, that usually they, they will need the data fast. On them on the bottom, FDA archive, and uh, well, that's, that can uh, be a little bit later. It's okay. So here, depending on who you want to address, you have different needs, meaning that you will need different systems, different level of validation of the data, different level of quality of the data. So it's, uh, it's a little bit complex. So for the next slide, on, on, uh, and so on, I'm going mostly to the study monitors, but I will tell you about what we do with uh, the, the exploration, the data explorers, and the data scientists in these systems. All the things that are on the bottom here are mostly the Novartis big GXP systems which are going to be used. Uh, it's not systems that are really designed for speed or innovation. Uh, it's not a place where you are going to, uh, well, it's a place where you can do uh, exploration, but usually it's not uh, the fastest way. So focusing on the top, people will need to have speed on a certain level of completeness. Um, we are try what we want to create is a, um, a one-stop shop to get the, all the, the clinical trials from Novartis in one place. First challenge, uh, we have many many sites, but also many CROs actually. So we are trying to focus more and more with time also to have less players in the system. But uh, when you are a large company uh, having that many clinical trials running, you have seen the number in the first slide, uh, well, it's not that easy to get everything centralized. So we try to get uh, all the data in one place. We try to make sure that the, the visualization are easy enough so that when you come, you don't need one week of training each time. You need to lower the barrier of energy. And, uh, and then, of course, for that, you need to totally hide the complexity of data. The data needs to be ready for you. And uh, on the challenge on the safety review, that is the use case here, is that you need the data basically every day or as soon as possible. Um, to, I would just at that, that point just say that the big safety issues that needs to be uh, like the serious adverse events that needs to be reported to the FDA. You have free days to report the things uh, anyhow caught by the, the sites directly. 
So that should not be, uh, well, we don't expect our system to be the one detecting it. If it's happening, it's not good for our processes. That means that someone missed something. What we are after are more things that are patterns, uh, patterns over the uh, several people or over time that would be slowly building and sometimes for a, a whole program, meaning that your study is one of a, a long series of studies. You know that before there were some findings. They know on site also. On site, they will have the in investigator brochure, which are telling them what was found in animals or in previous studies. So if we know that there was an issue with safety somewhere, that will be mentioned there. And if it was, uh, I don't want to say serious, but uh, well, something that was really uh, um, a safety which was clear, you should have already uh, by design uh, the instruction to follow the things. There was a liver issue, uh, uh, liver failures, please check on the lab parameters that are detecting that kind of problems. So we are not trying to replace the detection that are done on site, but we are trying to really look at the subtle patterns that you want to detect as soon as possible uh, to be able to catch early the things that you can do for patients on course correct if there are problems. And it's part of the regulation, we have to. Okay, so how does it work? So first thing, the storage. So uh, old-fashioned data warehouse, uh, no data lake, no fancy thing, no big data. It just uh, results small data, actually. If you think quick clinical trials, we have some uh, large parts coming uh, attached to clinical trials, um, all, uh, all the omics, all the uh, imaging, if you have the raw data, now the digital devices, uh, but usually the data sets are pretty small. So old-fashioned data warehouse is great in that case. Uh, and here I will mention on that slide also that we took the opportunity of agglomerating in one place all the talks on the MPK studies in animals because they're using the same standard as the description. So it can also translate in the system from animal to human on back translate. Uh, so then we load the data, CDISC again is the, the model as discussed before, SDTM uh, specifically in that case, so it's a sub part of CDISC used for the raw data. Uh, on them we are going to uh, give access uh, nearly real time, meaning that uh, every night we have a synchronization. So that's for the, the UI. And then we created the API, so for the UI, of course, but also for uh, for people who would do data science on that. We have few, uh, few uh, APIs uh, that, are, that are useful there. Um, so if I look at the data flow, um, on starting, uh, so starting on the uh, up there, actually, so we get the data from various places, and, and, uh, and again, that, well, for example, if you want to agglomerate some uh, some omics or some digital data, uh, well, you have specific systems that are coming in on top of the normal C disk. We're going to standardize, of course, and again, there are, sometimes you have to be creative, um, both with the data quality. If you need data that are not really clean, you have to see what you can clean up uh, on the fly. If you want to attach um, for example, while well, these devices that I just mentioned, uh, they will probably not have the same timing as the visits. You are going to visit from time to time, and then the digital devices are another pattern of time. Uh, so that's a lot of interesting things to do on that one. The standardization is not an easy one. Uh, of course, we're going to remap the things that are obvious to map, like uh, I mentioned Medra before, the adverse events, um, and then we load. And then, of course, there is a whole thing about who can access the data. Uh, so here we discuss data that are coded. Again, the sponsor, we, Novartis, never see the name of people, never ever. Um, but still, coded data are under consent, meaning that uh, the patients have signed an ICF, an informed consent, saying, OK, I'm OK to use it for the trial. That's the basic for the consent, otherwise we don't have the data and people are not in the trials. But then there is also some parts about what can be done in secondary use and all that. So I will come back to that later, but um, we have to be careful about who can see what. And then we are going to have uh, uh, on the left two parts, which one is that uh, end user application uh, that I'm going to, uh, to show in two slides. And the other one is uh, the access for data science. So doing, doing background analytics, uh, machine learning, and if possible, notify on the fly when there are some findings. Uh, that one is hard. We spend quite a lot of time 
uh, on that, and it's not an easy one. I'm back to that in a few slides, so we we discuss that bottom part. Uh, but just before the, the on the top here, the reporting, just to give you a flavor. So I felt compelled to add a, a, a diagram uh, since I was told that there will be some uh, informative people around. Uh, so as you can see, it's pretty simple. So we have a, a data warehouse, a little bit, little bit of uh, uh, transactional uh, uh, data also. Uh, on them, we have basically a Node.js uh, uh, system uh, with uh, well, all the things that you expect in the middle. On them, as a client, uh, we start iSharts, jQuery. So again, it's, um, well, it's, we reuse the Novati standards. So it's, uh, uh, it's things that we are trying to use everywhere. And the goal for that is to have a critical mass of people being able to read and use the application, well, not use, to read and develop the application around. So the idea is to reuse everywhere. So we are not there yet, let's be clear. But we are trying to get most of the stacks to look the same, so that when you lose a programmer, you may benefit from another one being around. Or when you are stuck with something crazy, you can just uh, post in the internal uh, stack overflow, saying, hey, guys, what's that? I don't get what's going on. So very, uh, very typical setup uh, at Novartis. And I'm looking at the client, uh, which is on the right. So what it looks like, so it's really basic. I will not go into a demo uh, because, well, I, I think that's uh, well, that's not easy to be honest uh, to, uh, to 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 be uh, fun and interactive. But you can see on on the top. So I just have the the basic demographic. So all that is customizable, by the way. You can save your templates and everything. But here I see on the top the age of my patients. So um, on the bottom here, I see the number of subject visits over time, uh, which is uh, um, telling me uh, how many people and visits I had over time. So that's the enrollment telling me if, uh, if the study is under control or not. And then we can go into the parameters. So here on the top, I have the blood pressure, for example. And uh, well, you can see over time the screening visits before the study on them um, with the dose. And uh, well, that's where people will look for patterns uh, appearing. And then since it's safety, of course, adverse events, so usually we create a heat map um, with the color representing the well, how serious that was, or uh, if the, the local people on site thought it was related to the drug or not, it's also uh, an indication that we get. Um, and you can see already that uh, here I lost on the left, no value. So that means that I lost some, some things already due to uh, quality. So my data are not coming uh, in the quality I would like. Uh, that's the first thing that the study monitor will do. He will come back to the, the site saying, hey, well, you need to clean up the data here. We are missing things. And then you see things happening um, in uh, well, various, various adverse events or various subjects. So again, I'm not going into a full demo here, but uh, the idea is that you see it's a dashboard. Uh, it's able to view uh, any patient, as many uh, as many uh, uh, panels as you want. The panels are linked, so I can select uh, a time or points and get the highlight in other places. I can also look at the, the, the patient view, which is basically just a timeline on all we know about what happened to the patient from well, all the medical history to all the follow-ups, if we have follow-ups after the, the trials. So um, on a... Well, we presented that already in other places. Uh, there will be a link uh, in the bottom of the slide in a few slides from now. So uh, I will not go into a full demo. But again, the spirit here is that we make the data available for people who need that on, uh, in a very um, quick and a little bit dirty sometimes manner. By the closure of the data, when, when we get the final data sets, of course, the data are clean. So that is another game. And I'm going to go now into what you can do with the with the data. But basically, at the beginning, the data are problematic. There will be some strange things, especially at the beginning, because of the setup of the, the trial, which sometimes is not perfect. And then with time, it's cleaner and cleaner and cleaner until the lock where everything is clean. There it's at DB lock at the end. It's what the FD will, re will receive. We can't, well, we should not unlock the database. It can happen, but it's... Uh, a, a quality uh, quality problem with a lot of documentation and all that. We should never ever unlock 
a database. It's happening from time to time, but again, it's things that are under control of the regulators. It's really hard. Okay, so now I have data. What can I do with my data? So first thing, there are the things that we have been doing for decades, well, since 50 years. Um, it's the first the interim analysis, if any. So by protocol, at one point, I'm going to look at the data during the trial to make a decision on continuing or not, usually. And then we have the database lock, which is at the end, I lock my database at the end, and I can really look at what I wanted to know. Usually, uh, well, depending on the phases where you are, but let's say that uh, you are going to look at safety and efficacy. That's the two main things, of course. There may be a lot of other things, including exploratory, exploratory endpoints, but well. So classical stats here, um, readout on signal follow-up, that's going to be SAS usually, classical stats, file system, sometimes some UIs now coming, uh, more often than, uh, than in the past. People are sending some r shiny apps. We have a full group in, uh, in uh, our development um, uh, organization doing uh, only r shiny apps now with reusable modules. So they, they provide to the, the team, the clinical team, uh, a way to browse the data. And, uh, and of course, it's linked to what we developed. We've changed some code on uh, everything. We do not have the same clients, customers, if you will. We do not have the same uh, time and the same objectives, but uh, we, we are using uh, quite a lot of things in common. Um, and then the other thing that is done historically is the pooling of data. So I, I have, uh, I'm going to do phase one, phase two A, phase two B, phase two B again, phase three, phase three, phase three on three indications. Well, I want to put all that together. Um, maybe for uh, efficacy, but absolutely for, for safety, because there you want to accumulate as many time on patients as you can to know what is the safety of your drug. There's also the dose modeling, where you want to see what's happening in different population. Mainly when you enter phase three, Phase one and two, you have a very small set, but in phase three, you start to have diversity of people. Some of them, you are going to give them uh, one gram of product and they will have no effect because the, the product it just metabolized very quickly. Others are going to metabolize very slowly. So the dose modeling is a big deal. And then I, I did here on two types. Uh, it's uh, checking if there are responders and non-responders that would be according to the different type of disease that can happen or the well, the history of the disease, if you are early, late, and all that. So again, here it's, um, uh, that will be mostly uh, uh, stats in uh, ad hoc databases and pools. Uh, we have seen some UIs also ap uh, appearing, but very rare, because here the game is to have a lot of data, meaning that the UI is not the best way anymore to look at things. So that's the historical things. Um, now with what we have uh, created, there are other things you can do actually. So assuming that you have a clean and timely data flow, so well, you're going to empower the, your scientist. Of course, you keep this thing, they are still doable, but at the end. But now I'm going to, to be able to do things during the trial. Uh, example, the patient safety review that I just, uh, that I've just shown. And at that time, sometimes the data are blinded, by the way. So blinded, meaning that you don't know who got what. Uh, in terms of compounds, placebo, if it was blinded. Uh, a lot or most of the trials are not blinded, actually. But um, so that's that's where we developed that trans transitional study platform that you have seen just before. And on the bottom here, you have a link uh, if you want to, to have more. There is a second part that I want to, to discuss now. It's really the secondary analysis, uh, the so-called uh, secondary analysis. So that's the concept that you can do more with a trial than just looking at the safety and efficacy of your compound. So what can you do? Well, a lot of things. I'm going to give you a few examples, uh, but it's really about back translation. So how the late can inform the early uh, projects. That's a virtual proof of concept showing that uh, you may be curing another disease with your compound. Uh, and well, there is more. So I'm going to show you a little bit on that. Um, first thing, uh, if you discuss with uh, clinical people in the companies, they will tell you, well, yes, but well, I mean, research, I have difficulties to access the clinical data. So that's that's a fact. Uh, that's uh, for for a long, long period. It was really hard. It's opening now. Uh, we had a workshop uh, maybe two years ago now at the EBI industry. 
uh, where we all met and discussed that. And we see that most of the companies are trying to free up a little bit their, their clinical data so that the research can benefit. So at Novartis, we created actually went through the trouble of creating a, uh, a whole documentation about uh, who should see what. And we published the high level in that paper that is in there. So if you're curious, it's quite interesting because again, breaking that, that silo is a big deal. At the end of the day, there is only one animal model on this human. So if you're not, not using this data, you probably write, uh, you probably try to work on uh, a model which may be totally not relevant for human. So it's a big deal to free up the data. And again, Novartis is quite progressive on that. We are quite far already, driven by um, uh, mostly by uh, well, TCN, so the, our executive committee who wonders that, so VAS, that you have seen before on a, a slide, and also the creation of a system called Data42, which was uh, the, uh, well, the creation of a big platform for secondary use of the data by people in R&D. Well, R&D on commercial, actually, that's covering the whole company. Okay, um, so what can I do with this data then? Um, so that slide is a little bit buzzy, but well, stay with me. So you see here we have the RCTs like research clinical trials, phase one, one and two on them three. Obviously, well, one of the goal of my phase one and two, well, phase two mainly, is to inform the cohort selection. So I want to understand how I'm going to design the, the phase three to have the right population in, which will benefit to the maximum and which will show efficacy and also will test my safety. So that's the obvious one. And also at that stage, you start to insert potentially some um, other things like biomarkers and all that to be able to get, uh, to be better on, uh, on the market compared to competitors. So the idea is to show that we are the, the best. And the idea also is to decrease the patient burden. Like for example, if you have the choice between an injection uh, to do every day or a pill to take once a month. Obviously, if you take a pill once a month, you have better chances to have compliance and patients will be happy and will do well. So, um, so all that are the classical game in the, in the, in all that. And what is not in that, um, what is not on that picture is that if you start uh, before, so in, in that range here, you have uh, the, the, the tox on the MPK animals. That one is going to inform also here what we're going to do, of course, for the first in human, the phase one, the dose mainly, but also the safety. And all that is uh, documentations that will be passed on to the, the sites. They will have the investigator brochure where they have all the story of what we have seen in terms of safety and potential issues and all that. So, so basically, all that part below the line are things that are just the basics of the, of the clinical trials. That's why we are them. The goal being to, of course, have the best outcome for the patient. Um, phase four are things that are done uh, after when we are on the market. PMCs are the post-marketing commitment. When you get a drug on the market, sometimes the regulators will tell you, yes, but we have a doubt on something. Uh, please make another study to show if we could extend the label to a new population, typically children that we don't test in clinical trials. Uh, sometimes when there is a prevalence of the disease in children, uh, the, the agencies are going to tell us, yes, well, could you please test? And since it's hard on for a small population, there are some incentives also linked to that uh, in some countries. But that's another story. Okay, now if I go to the top here, there are two types of back translation that are really fundamental. So from my package, I can go back on the other direction. So that will be the back translation. And of course, the first thing is that uh, I hope to find new targets. So what's that? Uh, while you are studying a disease, I just did um, a huge trial, well, many huge trial on any disease, Alzheimer, if you will. I've been collecting um, uh, tons of samples. I've been doing some uh, transcriptomics, some genetics, some proteomics, some metabolomics, uh, and other things. Well, maybe I'm able to find in that things that research would be interested in. On. So that's the, the, the most basic back translation is looking at all these clinical trials, the reward evidences as defined as the things that are in the all the, the theories, the medical uh, uh, the medical systems, and also the biobanks now 
there are many biobanks that are um, that you can access to find new targets. But well, the so that's the, the core of uh, so that's why we want to break the silos, bring this data to research, and that was done at Novartis pretty well. Uh, there is another thing uh, in the middle here, on the typing on new indication. So here it's really the idea that um, uh, the classical way of analyzing uh, clinical trials is going to deliver a lot of value. And I mentioned before that there will be already an assessment of the subpopulation, for example. But um, but can we find something uh, really, uh, uh, well, can we look deeper with a research mind to find new things? So on types are different types of the disease. So here the question is, can I identify that I have actually various types of the disease? Can I describe how I could select these people? And then can I find out which one would benefit from that compound or that other compound or the two or different combos on the lab? And then the new indications, well, it's the most obvious thing. You have a compound which is uh, reaching the market. Of course, you're going to look around, thinking, okay, who can I cure with that? I know it's safe already, it's on the market. Uh, I know it has efficacy for a disease, can I cure other things? And that's typically um, uh, research, medical research activities, looking at the kind of pathways, the mechanism of action of your drug, the pathways and all that kind of things. So, um, so this back translation going back, uh, is really a big deal, and again, it's it has been for a long time very hard because of the segmentation of data. Uh, I would state here that at Novartis we broke that uh, that thing. Now it works. We broke these silos, uh, but it's still uh, it's still really hard. And again, in the middle of that, you have to consider that you have a, a GDPR, informed consent, and many things that are an issue to be able to uh, to share the data. It's not like you own the data. Uh, the data are owned by the patients. They are under consent to us. We can do some things. We can do whatever we want. I'm going to uh, to give you a few examples of that just before. By the way, uh, it's usually not known, but uh, all the clinical raw data are, are available in the not the public domain, but are available to you if you're asking for them. Um, so there are two ways to access the, the data from our trials. One is through the FDA, uh, through the um, Freedom Act of Information. Uh, um, usually it does not work, except uh, in some cases uh, there, there is a selection and it does not work. But in Europe, uh, we have the EMA, so the Drug Agency of uh, Europe, who edited the two policies, uh, 043 and 070, which are enforcing the sharing of all the raw data from clinical trials. That means that if you have a, a case, or if you are not in some specific places that can be shared, you will have access to the data. So what are the tricks there? Because well, there are question is okay. Well, I don't remember having seen a big, a big database with all the clinical trial data. So what's going on there? Uh, there are a few things going on. Uh, the first thing is that the trick is that we are going to give you access. So there is a, a central. Um, well, I put you some links here. So you can make a request for any of the trials. Uh, if it's a phase one, you will not get it. I can tell you because well, that's uh, that's not enough passion that can be uh, well, that you can uh, de-anonymize. But then for the large ones, you should have access. But then the access is on a box which is remote, and you can't download everything, uh, anything. Sorry. So the system is that you are in a locked box where you can operate with SAS and R usually. Uh, so you can do your analysis, your research, but you are not able to download things. So still, what I wanted to say here is that you have seen on the slide before at Novartis, of course, we broke the, the silos and now we can exchange data um, between R and D, research and development. There are also some ways to access the data externally, any of the data that exists. And, um, and that's uh, quite interesting. I will mention also that uh, in the public domain now, totally public, you can find uh, at the FDA the submission packages where you will have everything that was submitted, edited for names on the uh, trade privacy and all that. And uh, on, at the EMA, you have the EPARS also, which are giving you all the details of what was submitted, why, and uh, what are the adverse events that were seen and all that. So there is a level of transparency, which is, I think, far above what people do think on all these things. 
OK. Um, checking where I am on time. On them, diving into a few cases, uh, just two cases to, um, to give you really a real flavor on that. Um, so bear with me on that one. <laughs> uh, you see here, you have the, the whole population of my trial. Um, if I look at different, uh, different markers on all that, um, can I find a sub part that would be more interesting for me for a reason? And if I look at the, the left, uh, the, the left part here, um, you have, um, uh, well, without telling you what's going on, here you have a, a placebo, the line on the top, and on the bottom you have with drugs, with different levels of the drug that we give to people. Now, what is interesting is that what we measure here, that thing, the HR by TKR, that you will have here the, the detail, is not the end point of our clinical trial. It's not the disease we are trying to cure with the, the thing. It's just a posteriori, looking at what we got from the clinical trials, another indication that is popping up. So just looking at, uh, at what we were doing, we looked at the, all the, the adverse events and all the history and all that. And what we see is a decrease of, the, of uh, an, adverse, an adverse event, let's say. So that's interesting. So we call that the virtual proof of concept. Basically, a posteriori, I look at all the things that happen. Is there any correlation with the time on the dose of my drug? Oh, yes, I have these things that are appearing. Not great, usually a safety if you have new things that are appearing. Oh, I have these things that are disappearing. I have less adverse events on that. Uh, we had another example with lung cancer, for example, where clearly we had less cancer in, a, in, a, in one of our trials. Uh, on there, well, of course, you can see the value for, for us. It's immediately a new population that you can treat. Our drug can benefit to more people. So the so these virtual uh, proof of concept are, uh, well, sometimes positive like that. So that's uh, great. So here, uh, you are just, uh, well, that's really cool. Um, sometimes it's negative also. So we have the experience that we tried uh, thinking, well, of course, we have an army of people who do know the, the compound, the disease, and they, they think, well, if we cure that, maybe we can cure that. And that's something that sometimes we can check in silico with these virtual proof of concepts to check if it works or not in the real life, or at least the real life of our clinical trial, which is a, a set with inclusion and exclusion criteria. So it's not really a real population. Um, so sometimes we killed some uh, some ideas based on negative proof of concept like that, virtual proof of concept. We checked on the data were not supportive. So we said, okay, we're not going to go for a clinical trial where people would have no benefit. And uh, of course, it's good for people if we find new indication. It's good for people if we don't run trials that are useless. And of course, globally for our business, it's a good idea to be efficient uh, that way. So that one is an example of something which is really um, mining at scale. Again, it was done um, since a long time it exists, but now it's systematic. Where in, in the past, that was a lot of uh, serendipity. That was a little bit of uh, the right guy, the right person coming and saying, hey, maybe we have something. Now we can do that systematically. Another one which is very popular on, um, on uh, well, obvious, I would say, is um, the virtual arms, so virtual control arms. Let's say that you are going to run a free, um, uh, free studies on the same indication. Okay, so I'm going to select uh, for free, uh, for free uh, trials some uh, cohorts. I will have cohorts selling the drug, probably different dose. I will have probably control somewhere. Uh, why, why having three controls? Can I get only one? If I have three times the same indication, three, three studies, can I just create one control group and use it in my three studies? Uh, and the answer is yes, and there are some settings now in the in trials to do that. But then if you extend that, well, can I reuse the, the control group from my study, which is uh, uh, one year old, 10 years old, 20 years old? So the question is, can I mine now my whole uh, database to find control arm, which would be uh, 
virtual because all these people who existed, but were from the past. Or can I even now go into creating a court, which is not uh, just a control that existed, but a composite of the people I need that I pick up from different trials to know what would be the background in that population. So that's um, so basically I, I create a control, a virtual control arms picking up people to get basically the background of what I expect. On a, well, you can play with um, clinical trials, what I just dis described, it's not easy, but you can play also with uh, reward evidences, yeah, reward data, meaning uh, I take the electrical health record of people uh, out there, and I can just bring that and create actually that, uh, that normal, since here we're discussing controls, so that will be the, the normal arm. Uh, benefit, well, of course, well, less people will be in the in the study with uh, not a real drug, which uh, from an ethical, ethical point of view is a, is a good thing because, well, we prefer to treat people uh, to get the maximum benefit for them. And of course, well, in terms of um, um, getting right on spot, that's a big deal actually because, well, uh, we can really fine tune all that. Uh, it's also, as an extension, uh, in the next slide, uh, I'm uh, maybe I would jump to the next slide and I would tell you how it's connecting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to add a last one. So re you remember that slide? Uh, we had uh, all these parts with basically the story in the middle, then the things that we added. There is a last bit that we can add if you have the, the data that are clean enough. You can now use the computers directly. So here you want to automate on a, well, each time you have data. You are going to check if there are some signals that are not what you want. So it can be quality, uh, like well, code list. Well, it's not in the code list. Okay, well, I have one percent. It's fine. I have ten percent. Well, I actually get an email to the person saying, uh, <laughs> "Come on, that's not and that's not okay." Um, that can be detection of specific events. Like well, we have a suspicion that we will have something. So we um, so we describe that risk. Uh, and again, in a clinical trial. You have now uh, a database of the risk that we expect. It's uh, it's mandatory now. And uh, well, you can really survey the, these things, checking if it's coming or not. And then the last level is really to just detect any signal. Like, hey, there is something which is not as usual. I did not expect that. And it can be very subtle because the computer can detect things before you do. But for that, the problem is that you need to have the right background population. So if you work with a disease, uh, you can't compare yourself to, um, uh, so, and again, we, we very often will be blinded also, so there are many things happening. But basically, what I said with the, the virtual control arms will be very true here also. One of the big deals if you want to detect signal in the population of people being sick, because by definition, uh, starting phase two, you are, you are taking people who are sick. You want to know what is the baseline of all the parameters you are going to measure. And that's not so easy, actually. That one is very tricky and that's very confusing. And on our side, we had many problems actually getting that baseline uh, properly done. So that's the, the read the, the difficulty on that, uh, that part. Well, still, that works. We have things that are, that are, we have daily feeds and we are looking at the data. So it's really things that are totally doable. And again, it does not look like, uh, well, it's not really the AI like uh, a chat GPT uh, revolution that we propose there. But again, it's the progression of things. We are getting there. We are getting to some things that are a lot better and that are getting, getting better, better and better. Which is a transition actually for the next slide, which is uh, about AI. Yeah, I needed to put AI somewhere. By the way, there was no fair keyword yet. Hmm. That's um, been missing that one. Um, so recent publication from uh, from some people who looked at uh, the, the submissions the last five years, and they looked at the number of uh, of submissions here. So it's uh, in there you have the number of submissions uh, that were including something AI. Uh, I will try to describe what it means over time. And you see, well, I think it's pretty clear that we have a trend here. Um, and then they looked also at the stages. So here again, a number of submissions uh, with AI uh, on where the AI was used in uh, 
discovery repurposing, non-clinical development, uh, clinical development and post-marketing. So clinical development is the win there. So I will state immediately that it's totally biased. That article is highly biased because they were looking actually on purpose to the well the IND uh, mainly. So that's really the, the submission. Uh, well, the IND in the US is the very first level of submission. Technically, an authorization to to send a, a non-approved compound across states, but actually it's really the first thing we do to submit at the FDA. So on the on the green path here are the INDs. So um, so that dossier yeah, is highly biased to the clinical development. But just to say that slide is biased, well that paper, but to be honest, I think they are that's true. Meaning that uh, more and more uh, there is more things that are done with machine learning, potentially deep learning, and also uh, uh, development of uh, well control arms, uh, inclusion of digital devices. There is a long, long tail of things that are being done, and I think that is a reality. So I have no doubt on that one. Uh, now, of course, well the numbers, well I would be careful, uh, but well uh, it's it's happening. So where is it happening? Ah, uh, the slide. So bear with me again. I could have animated that one, but well. Um, let let me just uh, give you a tour of that. And again, it's the, that's the spirit of a breakfast. If you have questions, happy to develop that one. Um, for clinical trial, one of the things that you would not believe if you're not part of that is how hard it is to create a good protocol. So why is that? Well, first you need to have the right endpoints. It's not the other thing, but you would need to have the right inclusion exclusion criteria to have the right population without making it impossible to recruit. And uh, so it's not easy actually. So here we have a lot of things going on. Um, at Novartis we have some projects using recommenders. Um, we are also able to read, uh, uh, well, we start to be able, that's coming, uh, to reread all the protocols on, um, on uh, give advice on uh, what should be done, what was done in the past and all that. So that's, um, so here I can fit the large language modeling on the chat GPT in. Um, and uh, well, just that one because well, I feel compelled since it's uh, the big, big thing right now. So chat GPT, bio GPT more for, for research actually. Uh, on, in general, the LLM is used at Novartis, but not yet really in the, the clinical setting. It's before that. We have a lot in the early uh, at the lead generation. Okay, but while designing the protocol, you can learn a lot. And already here you have the things machine learning able to tell you uh, what could be the per per perfect protocol to suggest things. And it's by plugging into uh, real world evidences, into epidemiology system to check how many people are, are what is the pool of people that we could treat on uh, how to best design our protocol. Can I help my patients to understand the trials and the consent? on the questionnaires, actually. Um, well, if you try to be a patient once, uh, it's just very hard. It's like going to a bank and you are given proof. You have to read that before signing. And you start to read and you are, yes, well, maybe I can skip that one on that one on that one. So it's mandatory for the investigators. Again, not the sponsor. It's not the pharma. It's the investigator on site. And it must be someone who is not linked, actually. Um, well, so. Okay, it's mandatory for someone not linked to uh, too close to the, the study to explain the consent to people. Um, but well, it's still very hard. On here, we see things that can be done better, uh, including uh, uh, with speaking AI, just things that will be more interactive, things that will explain better. Um, here, I don't know if you tried that one, but uh, PDF GPT is nice. So you enter a PDF and then you can uh, discuss with your PDF. Did you say that there is that happening? Uh, so. There are plenty of things we can do, but clearly it's linked to the, the consent, also the, uh, the informed consent, the ICF here, uh, because well, uh, I, that one needs to be very carefully explained to people, both because people have rights and they need to know exactly what that is. And, and believe me, it is done, it is done already. But also because for us, it's important to explain that uh, if they're going to give, for example, genetic consent, it will enable us to do genetic on them, of course, on UC, it's touchy, but well it's, well, it's what we are going to use for research. So if people are not signing up on that, it's hard for us. On the EQA, well, it's uh, all the art of having the questionnaire on the uh, screens. It's benefiting also there. 
Can we decrease patient burden? Uh, well, so the you know it's one of the objectives since uh, many years now to get the patient in the middle of the clinical trial. Uh, before it was ready, you were going into the hospital, you were told, well, sign here. Uh, well, explanation, of course. On a, now we're trying to make the protocols easier for people. Uh, and also the a well, lot of things, like informing them about what's going on, uh, all that kind of things. So, so here there are things like, um, for example, at Novartis, we have systems which are scoring the protocols giving us a score, hey, you are going to be a pain with them because of that, that and that. Uh, here I mentioned also the remote trials, which is um, uh, a way where basically people are staying at home, you are going to ship to them everything you need, and the local nurses are going to take care of the, the, proced the procedures, if any. Uh, there are plenty of ways, but the, AI, the AI, AI, AI part is really uh, for us, well, that way of uh, scoring the protocols on um, on learning from the past, and also now all the digital devices that are tracking uh, people remotely. Um, how to target the best people? So I, I discussed before genetics, endotyping, different subtypes of disease, disease. also uh, diagnostics uh, that you can do for AI. For example, uh, we have examples where people can uh, take a photo of their uh, psoriasis um, and get, uh, get a mini diagnostic. We have uh, examples of models that we create uh, for uh, well, looking in the eye, for example, for different stages of, uh, of disease uh, to be used, of course, them with a specialist. So there are plenty of things happening there. Um, making trials cheaper. So of course, the clinical trials are the big expense for a clinical, uh, for a clinical program. Um, so digital control arms, digital twins also, tokenization. The tokenization is um, that one if you are if you never heard about that one, it's interesting. It's the concept that we could link the electronic health record of people with our clinical data uh, just by putting a, a unique ID in the middle. Unique ID that could not be reversed on them. Right? It's uh, technically complex. Uh, that one has the potential to really create great things. So of course, for clinical trial, that would bring us directly all the medical history of people. But the big deal for us is that we could track people one year, five years, 10 years after the trials. So in terms of safety, it's uh, uh, amazing capacities there. Patient compliance is always very hard. It's what is uh, creating a lot of failures in clinical trials. So of course, digital theories, continuous monitoring uh, with digital biomarkers. Can we get better results, p-values? So it's biomarkers. Now we are thinking about new ways with imaging. We have new ways to monitor with digital devices. All that is uh, machine learning. Can we get faster data collection and reporting? So, well, we discuss anomaly detection. Uh, it's one of the way to clean the data as, as soon as, as uh, possible, of course. Can we better monitor the, the portfolios? That one is uh, specific uh, to Novartis, I think. You have a, a link on the, on the right. Um, oh yeah, I will share the slides, by the way. I should have done, <laughs> said that before. Um, we created at Novartis uh, uh, a control tower which is monitoring all our clinical trials at once. So if you type Novartis Science, you will have, um, you will find it in uh, the external doma uh, public domain. Um, while during COVID, uh, it worked very well, where we, we were not able to enroll anymore. All the, all the patients uh, were blocked at home. And to be honest, they did not have time for research in the, in the clinics. Uh, so, um, so that worked very well for us to really refocus, focus in the right countries, be dynamic and all that. That one is interesting also. Uh, can we pay only if the drug works? Uh, so it's called the uh, outcome-based uh, contracting. Um, it's something which is, uh, the Vatis have been trying many things. It's really about data, traceability of the things. Um, and right now, well, Things are happening, but it's small, small scale, so we are not yet into the global big data sets, but it's where it, go, it goes, of course. And then I would just mention that uh, having been part of that work, uh, we developed also at Novartis uh, an ethical uh, guide for how to use uh, AI, and it's including clinical trials. And uh, well, we're not the only company. I know of three who, who did that in the pharma companies. Um, well, we have to be careful about all that because uh, we have, um, well, when you speak about selecting people, immediately you can see that uh, you could have biases. 
on um, on well that's uh, that's a problem on them of course when you have all the data we have we can look at the past also so we have been looking at uh, who we have in clinical trials on uh, it's not well balanced clearly so we are doing well on the on the men women ratio for example but when you look at uh, where people live it's usually in uh, in large countries um most of the trials on them within the countries it's near the large cities on them uh, well there are a few papers who have been documenting biases and on populations for example um uh the last two years there was quite a few papers about uh, how much in the genetic space uh, the biobanks in asia are missing uh, so now it's coming so we have a lot more uh, but in parallel we discovered or rediscovered that in africa uh, the genetic is so diverse that it may be more diverse than the rest of the world actually it's just amazing the diversity there that means that we have to cover a lot more people to get really a view of who we are going to cure. So that's, um, so again, having a lot of data will help on all, on all that. And uh, we are making that effort since many years. Uh, what I call the AI here is basically just looking at data that uh, usually with computer, machine learning and all that. But what it's, um, basically it's, uh, let's say that we are on a long, long journey around the clinics and we are doing pretty well right now, I think, uh, on making the things better. It's way too slow, I think. <laughs> I'm frustrated because I'm part of it and I think we are not fast enough, but it's coming. It's really going a lot better than it used to be. And on that note, uh, I would just share with you the deck, which is accessible through that QR code if I did not fail. Otherwise, the link up there would uh, give you access to it. And I will stop there and take any question if, uh, if there is any. Thanks a lot, Philippe. Uh, very interesting, impressive uh, review and uh, all the clinical trials and the use of AI. So do we have any questions? So <coughs> please speak up or use the chat. I don't have any questions in the chat at the moment. Maybe I will start with the first one. Max, OK, Max, go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe a stupid question, but I'm interested to hear your answer, Mark. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, with the virtual control arms, is it, do you still blind the studies then with the treatment group? You know, it's like, do you claim that there's no virtual control or what's the thought pattern there? <laughs> um, well, so I would say by default, yes, you could still blind because, um, because you, what if you have different doses? Uh, maybe you want to uh, uh, to blind to make sure that uh, you don't conclude too fast. But to be honest, on that one, the truth is that I don't know. So I would have to check. Uh, but I, I would say that by default, well, first we try to uh, to blind at minima. That's also a trend, uh, um, well, in the industry, I think, uh, because well, you don't always need that. On uh, on if you have. Uh, of course, no placebo anymore. anymore. But it's tempting to think that you would not blind anymore. Uh, but still, there are other things uh, in the in the trials that uh, may need to be blinded, including the the dosage. But to be honest, I'm not the right person to answer that one, so I can't tell. Thank you, Max. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Any other questions? A question. I've got a question related to that, Philip, regarding the digital twin. Because I've got mm -hmm. a lot of seen a lot of publication regarding a twin RCT and uh, to use uh, how we say statistical methodology like uh, prognostic uh, covariance adjustment uh, to reduce or finally to prognostic uh, the 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 control arms. So, so are you using that at Novartis? So did you use this uh, statistical methodology of digital twin for some clinical trials? Um, uh... I would prefer not to comment on that one. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it's a very interesting concept. And, uh, and again, that's, um, well, many people are, are, are working on uh, on that right now. I think we are not ready for adoption by the DF authorities, but it should come. I think there will be uh, things coming. And uh, there are concepts like that, that, um, that when you see them, you think it's obvious. But then when you look at uh, how it's done, it's... Uh, yeah, it's far from obvious. So we'll see where it goes. That one is uh, really promising. 
uh, but I would predict that it will take a while before we get mature on that one. Uh, but again, being in research, uh, well, I think at 10 years for the deliverables of what I'm doing, so the, the digital twins is something that needs to be worked on now, yes. Well, maybe more related to the data warehouse when you started the presentation. So you combine, uh, we, we know the, the big data 42 project at Novartis, but you combine research data and clinical data. Can you just give us types of challenges you've got by combining uh, research data with clinical data? Yeah, so the translation uh, on back translation is uh, quite hard. So I just discussed the clinical data, so it's pretty hard. Um, one thing that I did not mention yet in that talk, and I should probably somewhere, is that uh, I discussed a lot about the clinical data as raw data, um, like um, so the SDTM part of CDISC for people who are in CDISC. There is another part which are all the derived data, which is stored in another container of CDISC, or container, another part called ADAM. And uh, that one is not really under control. That's becoming better there also, but uh, we, are, we have still difficulties to export data from the clinical results on uh, in some places like uh, for example in oncology you will always have a curve of survival uh, these survival points will be in that part for example in uh, the mpk uh, well you have two domains in uh, sdtm for the mpk but despite that you will have two other domains in adam that are really useful also so we have some gaps still in the clinics now on the translation which uh, which is your your question uh, I think the, the difficulty is to find out really where it's going to pay off. So we have things that translate, uh, uh, which are obvious to do. So for example, the toxicology studies, you want to understand what is translating from a finding, well, I have a finding in animal. Is it going to happen in the human? On the opposite, I have no finding, but now I have something in, a, in, a, in human. What's going on? So first case, I have something in, a, in the animal that will not translate in human. Example, uh, my dogs are vomiting. The dogs are vomiting for everything. So that just, uh, so we know it will not translate. It's not, uh, uh, well, it may translate, but it's rare. And that's, uh, that one is, uh, a f let's say fun, fun example, but, uh, but there, are, there are things we know will not translate at all. And uh, on the other side, uh, sometimes you have findings uh, late in clinical trials, and you are there, well, why did I miss it in the animals? And that may be that we did not use the right species. So there are some rules, as you know, but uh, while using um, small <coughs> species than large one, and sometimes, uh, well, uh, well, to minimize the cost on uh, on animals now, because here also that's well, we are trying to minimize the use of animals on uh, on also, uh, but try to to use uh, well animals which are as small as possible. Uh, sometimes we are missing things. So that's I, I think the well, the big deal, and for that one, uh, there are large projects like uh, the IMI e TransSafe, for example, which uh, just concluded uh, well, last month, I think, which was uh, driven by uh, Novartis and Bayer. And uh, we have been spending um, e TransSafe plus another project before that was called eTox. We spent uh, more than 10 years working on that, on that translation from animals to humans. And the way to get there are to create Rosetta stones uh, between the effects that you have in human, so mainly uh, the Medra for the adverse events, but also the differences in the labs. Um, when, uh, well, I mean, reading out of the, the raw parameters, even if usually a big effect in the labs will be also an adverse event, but not always. And then doing the same in, uh, in the early with animals, where we do not have adverse events, but we have daily observations. On them, uh, we have also something else, which is the histopathology, where you have per organ the findings at the end, plus the clinical pathology, which is the lab. So, um, so a lot of changes on the translation. And again, well, if you look at uh, what e transsafe did, they created some um, some ways to translate. On them, if you go more early, uh, so you have the animals that are used, uh, the models that are used mostly for, for PD, so for pharmacodynamic, for the efficacy. Um, well, very often it does not translate well to human. That one is um, well documented now that we have huge problems to use. Uh, and again, that's why uh, the only good uh, animal model is human. Um, so that's a challenge. And then um, 
uh, in terms of data, when the, the, I would say that more than data, it's the philosophy when you go very early. So now I'm thinking about, um, for example, uh, uh, QSAR, so some models that can be uh, uh, machine learn, learned on, uh, on structures now. And uh, it's, you need to have endpoints that are clear enough to, uh, and direct enough to have something. For example, if I want to predict if my compound is going to destroy DNA, that would be, that would be the equivalent of the first uh, GXP uh, test that we do, which is called the DMS test. So bacteria which is reacting to everything, so the DNA explodes if there is any uh, genotoxicity. That's something that we can predict very well in silico, simply because it's direct. Same for skin rash. If you want to predict skin rash, it's pretty easy. Now, if you want to predict uh, uh, liver failure, there's probably no way because to get there, you have uh, 1,000 ways to get there. And uh, so many people are, have been trained, are still trained, by the way, it's still a topic. Um, uh, so it's really hard. But I would say that in terms of data, at least at Novartis, we have right now people who are creating some, uh, some model on uh, the low molecular weight chemistry early based on findings of the light, meaning talks, of course, the MPK, so ADME on ADMET, but also now with clinical trials. So that compendium we were able to do on a large part of that uh, being with Data42 in the middle, that was um, a very large exercise, but that benefited uh, uh, for people who did that. But again, more than the, the techniques here, very often we are limited by the, our understanding of the biology. Coming back to the what Vas was saying on the slide that I've shown. And that's, uh, that will change, but it takes a while. That's uh, every day we discover more. Thanks, Philippe. Any other questions? I've got one on the chat. Is there a combination of tissue samples, for example, tumors with clinical, clinical data? Uh, well, so yes, so um, so in the clinical uh, uh, world, we are trying to collect uh, as much sample as we can at Nipper, but also later when we go to large phases to get uh, biobanks that are useful. Um, again, we can't do that uh, just uh, deciding we do that. We have to uh, to add uh, that to the informed consent and all that. Uh, typically, all the the Nipper sponsored trials are going to ask the patients to sign a, a genetic informed consent uh, so that we can get the DNA out on sequence. So that's systematic for all the all the NIBR trials. Um, on many, many, many of the large late trials, we are doing proteomics also. So that's uh, uh, yet another consent that we ask. And then we keep these samples for a long time, of course. Uh, so, uh, according to the regulation, there is also tons of regulations around that. And that's used for the back translation, yes, that's where we go. So, when I was saying that um, you can go back to the targets, it's that kind of things that we are going to use typically. Uh, so, you mentioned oncology, it's a very good plug, and thanks for that one. So, um, uh, on the paper saying that a lot of ML is used, ML uh, AI is used for the clinical trials, 25% uh, of the, of the the findings were in oncology. And that's not random, it's because oncology has a lot more technicalities and techno technologies that you can use on patients. So you're going to look at the tumor, of course, um, tumor that could be xenograft into an animal or so to do um, other things, other type of things. You are going to look at the micro environment of the tumor, it's a big deal since few years. Uh, now that oncology is really closely associated to the immunology questions, on, uh, on them, you are going to look at, of course, at many other parameters. Um, so RNA, DNA, but then you are going to play with epigenetics. That one is crazy. It's the way our DNA is changed over time in our life. Um, and of course, we do that for the, the targets that are directly acting on the epigenetics. So we have in our portfolio some targets, that, things that uh, will help us to cure that are modifying that. But we see also things that are happening uh, in, uh, in these tumors. Uh, that are, uh, well, that potentially could help us to target the things, but also that are explaining what's going on. Well, epigenetics, it's hard right now. But yes, so that's really uh, the, having access to samples 
is really one of the key for research on the back translation. Um, we do that in clinical trials, again, under all the regulations and information that we need. Uh, we do that also with the biobanks, where some biobanks, external biobanks, do offer a recall of patients, uh, either for samples, for sampling, or even to create cohorts, by the way. There are also uh, it's something that exists and biobanks uh, do propose that kind of services. Of course, not everyone will come back, but usually when you're in a biobank, well, you already signed enough papers so that you may be interested in be part of research around uh, uh, the things. Well, if you're going to be selected, you probably have um, uh, some indications for that. So that's interesting. Um, and sample management is uh, one of the, the key, by the way, of the logistics of clinical trials. If you ask me about what is hard in a clinical yeah. trial, uh, that's really complex, really complex. Very good question. Yeah. Thank you, Philippe. Any other questions? We have three minutes. Yeah. One more question, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot of use of AI in clinical trials. I just want to comment for the real world uh, data. We didn't cover too much this part today, but it's also a big area when we are uh, covering and maybe can use more uh, data analytics or AI tools in order to, to help also for the protocol design, to help for the design of all the trials. So, so I'm sure at Novartis you are also using real world data for, uh, yeah. for such type of things. Yeah, yeah, that's massive on a, to the level where uh, when you see the cost of that, it's uh, it's calling for a clear return of investment because it's really, really, really expensive. Uh, yes, we are using that massively. So in research, more and more, historically already in the clinical trial design since a while, and then before that, there was people on the on the different markets using that for uh, their pricing on the reach out to patients. So really a lot of things ongoing. And again, it's tightly linked to the biobanks. It's the same concept basically uh, in a different flavor. And if the tokenization that I mentioned before works, we know in uh, three to five years, uh, then we could really link the reward evidences on the clinical trials. And there that would create a consumer, which would be amazing for research. Some people are going to freak out about privacy, but in terms of uh, research, it would be really great. Uh, we have a last minute question from Elke. You also support distributed trials where patients use their own devices and how do you pull the data after? Yes, we do. Um, so we, are, we were pioneers in the neighbor of the uh, remote clinical trials. Um, usually we did rely on an external company to do it. So they were doing it themselves uh, for the real remote trials. And now for the digital devices, there is the far west right now. A few of the devices are certified and will be clean enough to get um, well, some systems where you have some uh, APIs to fetch the data. Uh, but very often we still have to create uh, a companion uh, uh, companion app that you put on a, uh, on a an iPhone, an iPhone or an Android, usually actually, um, on a, to collect the data and stream the data. So that one is uh, complex and, um, and not fully solved, I would say. So we're able to do it, it works, but uh, it's not optimal yet. Thank you, Philippe. I think it's uh, the last question and thanks to all the participants and uh, a big thank you to for the presentation, Philippe. Really appreciate the, the review and uh, everything you are doing at, uh, at Novartis. Well, thanks for the, the invitation, really, and thanks Thank for you. people who join. If you have any questions, please drop in the, the chat and we can continue conversation later on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, all. See you. Thank you very much.